Okay, so I'm just doing very fast. So uh, Dr. Gordon Keeler joined DAPA in uh, August 2017. He's the program manager in the Microsystem Technology MTO. His objective was to accelerate the development of emerging photonics, electronics, and integration technology to open new pathways. So Dr. Gordon Keeler, take it away. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, and uh, thanks to everybody who's here. I'm going to tell you about some of the uh, related programs that we've got going on at, at DARPA in the Microsystem Technology Office. I'm going to touch on some of them at uh, high level and then kind of dig down into where I thought uh, might be interesting for this crowd. Um, also, thanks to uh, Subhashish uh, and John, who just told you about some of the uh, other DARPA programs that we're doing, including pipes. I'll get into that and uh, 3D SOC. Okay, so uh, today I'm gonna be talking about sort of a, a mix of some of our integration uh, programs, some of our electronics, and a fair bit of photonics as well. That's uh, kind of my background. All right. So when I put this together, I actually uh, went back to uh, look at when I first got into heterogeneous integration and um, I was putting together a, a slide deck back in 1999 for a, a DARPA review. At the time when I was a grad student, we had a bunch of DARPA programs. And I pulled this slide because I thought it was kind of neat to see uh, where we've been coming from. Um, this was work that we were doing at the time. We were doing sort of a mix of heterogeneous integration, two and a half and 3D. We're doing custom CMOS chips with uh, three five diodes flip chipped on top, sort of what we thought at the time was pretty tight bump density, 40 microns in one dimension, 60 in the other, uh, trying to do optical IO, trying to do photonic microsystems. Um, and, and I would say here I am 22 years later, I'm doing the same thing. And uh, the argument might be, are, are we there yet? Or are we just gonna keep doing this? Um, the same kinds of topics. And this is what I'm gonna tell you about today. But uh, the difference, one difference is that now I'm representing DARPA rather than talking to DARPA. Uh, but the other is that, in fact, I, I think we really are there. Um, this is no longer demonstrating concepts sort of at a university level in, in a lab. This is uh, working uh, with commercial technologies, spinning this stuff out and, and gonna have real impact. And so hopefully I get across some of that excitement today. All right. Uh, just briefly introducing DARPA. I think most of you are super familiar, or at least pretty familiar. We've been around for about 60 years. Uh, DARPA has made a lot of the sort of pivotal early investments in, in new technologies. Um, over the years, you know, ARPANET, MOSES, GPS, stealth technology, uh, autonomous navigation, uh, a lot of work in AI and machine learning these days. Um, Looking at uh, how we're set up, we have six technical offices. Uh, sort of at the at the left hand side here, we've got a couple that are a little bit more basic science. There's uh, biological technologies and defense sciences. Uh, in the middle, I kind of think they belong here. Is I2O, which is really about cyber, um, and MTO, microsystem technology, which is where a lot of the component technologies live, and I'll be talking about today. And then we sort of have these, these couple of system level offices, uh, STO and TTO, that uh, build systems and build even bigger systems, uh, planes and ships and all sorts of things like that. All right, so uh, kind of now narrowing in on, on some of our microsystems work, uh, we really touch on a whole lot of different applications. And you've so far heard today um, a pretty big emphasis on compute uh, I'll talk about that some today, but we do a lot of other things as well. Uh, information processing, not necessarily for compute, maybe for uh, doing things at the edge. Uh, a lot of sensors and, and imagers and things like that as well. And so actually today I'm going to touch on each one of these and I'm going to come back to it, use it as a bit of an outline uh, to show you how different programs fit into these different buckets. Um, all of these are important in different ways. Uh, microelectronics and photonics are sort of uh, instrumental in enabling what we do in all of these areas. Okay, so these program examples I'll tell you about. Um, 
the CHIPS program, which I think actually a lot of the folks in uh, this audience are, are pretty uh, closely familiar with, and you've probably heard about at, at previous uh, symposia. Uh, the PIPES program, which has a lot of similarities, but is, is focused on heterogeneous integration of photonics for microelectronics. Uh, the MOAB program, uh, which you'll see is it's about controlling light with uh, very complex, sophisticated inter integrated photonic circuits. Uh, the DODOS program, uh, which is really about uh, sort of pushing to another uh, domain, and I'm going to move into LUMOS as well, which is really going farther with uh, integrated photonics and, and doing things that we couldn't do before. And so it's sort of getting out of the, the data processing world and getting into sensors and you know, quantum systems and things like that. All of it, however, is enabled by heterogeneous integration. Okay, so first, computing. Uh, we have a whole lot of programs in uh, computing domain these days in MTO. Uh, arguably, we always have, uh, but this has gotten strengthened uh, in the last few years. I'm going to first talk about CHIPS, the Common Heterogeneous Integration and IP Reuse Strategies Program. Uh, this is a program that's been around since about 2017. Uh, I took it over about a year ago when uh, Andreas Olofsson uh, moved on. And, you know, it's, it's had a, a, a lot of progress. And in fact, a lot of these technologies have already spun out um, outside the walls of DARPA into other things. I'll talk about that real briefly. Uh, but before I go there, I was going to give you a bit of a, a high level overview about uh, what we're doing in MTO and uh, how we're structuring our programs in microelectronics. So Electronics Resurgence Initiative, ERI, uh, this is an effort that we started about three years ago. It is a uh, collection of programs uh, that are sort of deliberately targeting what's next in the microelectronics domain. Uh, if you look back historically, kind of look at, for instance, Moore's Law kind of progression, uh, DARPA was kind of making investments all along we did a lot of things in advanced lithography. Uh, I mentioned Moses already came out of a DARPA program. Um, a lot of the various kinds of um, new transistors like FinFET and so on. Uh, now some of DARPA investment actually sort of tapered off in the uh, sort of 2010 timeframe. And then as ERI came in, uh, we've had a, a big renewed uh, push. So ERI is looking at what are the uh, investments and capabilities that we need to define what's next. Um, again, I said it's a collection of programs. Uh, we kind of structure it in our minds this way. We've got sort of some foundational programs, uh, like the JUMP program, which is a, a, a big collection of university level investments. Um, and then there are these sort of three different pillars of programs that have come on over time. Uh, the materials pillar, which is really about heterogeneous integration, uh, contains several different things. The ones in yellow are programs that I'm running and ones that I'll talk about today. Uh, CHIPS, which is about uh, integration sort of uh, as a whole. Uh, 3D SOC, you heard about uh, earlier from uh, Subashish, um, carbon nanotubes. Frank, which is about integration of uh, new memory technologies. T-Music about RF technologies. Pipes is about photonics. And uh, Lumos is uh, bringing new materials to the photonics platform. And then there's other things, uh, of course, that we're doing in, in terms of architecture, design, security, and so on. All right, so if I sort of step back and, and look at the reasons for heterogeneous integration, you know, it means something different to probably everybody who's watching today. Um, and so I, I'm going to walk through a little bit of what I think it means. Um, but, you know, before we had heterogeneous integration, we had other ways to get where we wanted to go, right? Originally, Moore's Law was driven entirely by geometric scaling, and that uh, gave us legs for a long, long time. Um, however, as that started to sort of peter out, uh, we looked for new knobs to turn up, and uh, arguably the, the first one was uh, working on the back end of line, right? So, so improving interconnect, getting uh, better data movement. And again, sort of a third wave of innovation was going into the third dimension, FinFET, um, high K dielectrics, strain engineering. And this one's not done yet, but this was 3D at the component level. Uh, 
the fourth wave really, which is sort of a collection of things is where we are today. And this is driving most of the types of innovation we see in microelectronics. It's bringing new materials. Um, it's doing domain specific functions rather than general purpose compute uh, and moving into 3D architectures rather than just components. So, you know, again, trying to define a little bit what heterogeneous integration means. Um, I, I would kind of say that there's three different elements to this. The first one, perhaps the simplest, and, and um, you know, coming from a, a world where I, I did a lot of work in three fives, this is uh, almost funny to call it heterogeneous integration to some folks, but uh, you know, the chips program and chiplet integration, heterogeneous integration of advanced nodes, different nodes, um, it's all silicon, but uh, taking a modular approach and putting things together, uh, 3D or 2.5D, uh, has huge advantages. I'll talk about chips next. Uh, but next, I want to say sort of up the uh, HI ladder is functional diversity, integrating new types of capability onto a wafer or into a package. Um, and so this is often used to eliminate the constraints that we've got in swap or IO. Um, putting analog or mixed signal or photonics or even MEMS into the package. We have a few programs in ERI doing that. And then last, and this is the most challenging, uh, this is about uh, bringing new materials and sort of scaling up in a, in a third dimension often. And so I'll talk some about this materials diversity challenge of uh, bringing new materials to uh, an existing platform, LUMOS program, which is about lasers, um, Frank, and 3D SOC. Okay, so again, uh, I decided not to put a whole lot of uh, slides into this talk on the CHIPS program because I think that uh, people have seen it uh, before. Uh, but just as a high level overview, um, you know, there are a lot of drivers for this program. Uh, some of them were just about scaling performance. Uh, some of them were about uh, scaling uh, performance without driving up cost. Uh, you know that when we, uh, we heard earlier today, um, when we compose a system with multiple chips rather than uh, one large monolithic chip, you can drive up yield and therefore drive down cost. Um, but one of the biggest ones, frankly, is uh, the ability of, of small players like the DOD um, or smaller companies to access some of these advanced nodes. If you look at, say, some of the uh, highest end GPUs today, um, in order to make these designs in, in seven nanometer, five nanometer, uh, uh, companies like NVIDIA are, are spending on the order of 2000 man years of design time. And when you have to do that, you actually sort of price out just about everybody from entering the market. However, if you can reuse existing IP and, and typically you can reuse a whole lot of it, um, your design costs can go way down. And so the idea was essentially, let's have a, a whole library of reusable IP and not just IP, but hard IP uh, and compose systems with pseudolithic integration. So chips came online in 2017, about a, a dozen companies and teams working together, uh, trying to solve a few different uh, challenges. One of them is uh, how do we have a, a universal interface so that you can put your chiplets together um, without having to make new ones every time? How do we have a, a state-of-the-art manufacturing assembly process that you can do it with uh, you know, small bump pitch and uh, high yield? And what are the uh, critical set of uh, IP blocks that you need to build these systems? If successful, there are a whole lot of uh, benefits that uh, can be derived out of this approach. And in particular, the system integrators um, that are trying to build new hardware can achieve what they want without having to wait for years and do all of these complex designs. So there's been, uh, I mentioned several years of work here. Um, I wanted to highlight just a couple things. Uh, a big one is work that's been coming out of Intel. Uh, Intel has been uh, doing a lot of the heterogeneous integration and working some, with some of the other performers on chips. In particular, working with uh, Jariot, working with University of Michigan, uh, working with others, and doing a lot of the integration of, of new capable chiplets into the package. A really great example is uh, 
shown here on this board. This was uh, Stratix 10 FPGA um, in January last year. Uh, Intel and Jariot demonstrated integration of uh, state-of-the-art 64 giga sample per second RF data transceivers. Uh, fantastic performance, but importantly, all of these data transceivers put into the FPGA. Um, now, because the chips modular approach uh, is so scalable, uh, Intel went from first demonstration of the concept to announcing just this month a brand new product uh, based on this technology. They've been sampling it to uh, Defense Primes and, and others for a little while, but now this is technology that has spun out of DARPA before the program is even over. Um, it's really exciting, and, and now there's uh, a big push to bring several different kinds of chiplets into this, uh, into this ecosystem. I'll also mention uh, the SHIP program. This is a, a program run out of uh, OUSD r &E, so out of the Pentagon. Uh, even bigger investment than, than chips. And the point here is to stand up a uh, onshore manufacturing capability so that we can do this sort of at scale and uh, uh, reasonably quickly. And there's a whole lot of other work that I don't really have time to, to touch on, but I thought a, a really uh, a really nice example of some of the other work going on is shown here for, from uh, UCLA, uh, Subu Iyer's team, showing how you can scale this approach. And so they've been working on, um, you know, high, fine pit bump and uh, many, many dialets, um, showing in fact, on the order of 2000 dialets being attached at wafer scale to do uh, large scale computing. Okay, so let me uh, lift us back up and look at what else uh, we're doing at DARPA. Um, think about the information space and moving into pipes. Uh, John talked about this briefly. And so I'm gonna give you a bit of a, a quick primer on what we're doing here under the pipes program. So pipes, which is sort of this functional diversity integration uh, came about by the observation that even if you have the best uh, transistors in the world and you put them close together, ultimately our systems are often limited not by our, our ability to do processing, um, but our ability to move data around both on chip and, and off the chip. We did a survey of, sort of state of the art CPUs, GPUs and FPGAs over the last um, roughly 30 years, looked at various things here for simplicity. I'm just showing you the power in a package um, has been going up exponentially over time, but uh, are relatively shallow curve. Um, what you see is that if you look under the hood, we're moving more and more data off chip, right? And uh, the power to do that has been growing at an unsustainable rate. This is because the CERTES that we use to drive uh, our interconnect has be become, in some cases, on the order of uh, 40 or 50 percent of the power used in that chip. If you're using a couple hundred watts to drive power uh, out of an advanced FPGA or switch ASIC, then you can't keep scaling forever because suddenly the power for off-chip I.O. has become more than the, the chip is supposed to be itself. So Pipes is looking to solve this by bringing photonics to the package. Um, and it's using sort of chips like two and a half D or 3D integration. Uh, our goals are to increase IO bandwidth, um, efficiency and reach of the interconnect. John talked about the ability once you get into the optical domain to transit sort of a rack or, or a room. Um, we have many teams. We have an order of about 12 different teams working on different things. And uh, the first goal is deployable multi-chip modules with photonic IO built right in. Um, in particular, we're trying to put 100 terabit per second into state-of-the-art FPGAs and also develop these underlying technologies like frequency combs and, and optical switches. Let me move on here. Uh, first, uh, the motivation for the program, if you look sort of at a, at a white space chart, was looking at how important interconnect really is and how it scales. Um, this shows a number of different common interconnect uh, types as a function of length on the bottom, log scale, log scale on the uh, uh, y-axis showing the, the important figure of merit where we're talking about bandwidth density. So the amount of IO that you can get in and out of a, a given package 
and the energy efficiency. How much power does it take to drive that? You can see in orange here, this is sort of the AIB standard or, or chips. So when you're within a package, you know, it, it's pretty good. As you go longer and longer distances, millimeters or maybe across the board, it goes down uh, very, very fast. And then uh, if you wanna go off board today, everybody is using optics, but you take a giant hit to get into the optical domain. Once you get there, it's pretty flat because optics travels great, but you've taken, you know, four or five orders of magnitude hit to move data optically today. Uh, in fact, it's worse than that. If you want to use optics, you have to first drive off your chip uh, across your board and then into an optical transceiver. So the actual performance of that has to add them all up. We're trying to put optics into these packages and move this dot all the way up uh, to here, which is to say uh, MCMs that have basically performance that is like in package performance, but can travel uh, tens of meters. Uh, and so uh, touching on that disaggregation concept, if you can put a hundred terabits out of your package and your latency and your energy looks like you're just signaling within package, it completely changes the way that you architect a system in the future. Our TA2 actually has much more ambitious goals and this is using some 3D integration techniques uh, to get even better energy efficiency. Ultimately there, we're trying to push another order of magnitude petabit per second out of a package. And so again, the concept is really removing data locality as a design bottleneck. Data, once it's in the optical domain, can travel very far. Okay, so if, it's, if successful, there are a, a number of different uh, benefits here. In the DoD, we're looking particularly at, at using this for uh, RF phased arrays, uh, radar, uh, 5G and comms, because these are the kinds of systems that have enormous uh, bandwidth uh, needs right at the front end. You can imagine those RF data converters that I talked about previously on chips. Uh, when you digitize all that data, you've just got a, a giant fire hose coming out the back end. And so if you can integrate optics in there, that's a, a fantastic solution. There are a number of different kinds of sensors that have the same, uh, the same story. In the compute world, obviously data centers need this as well, um, HPC, and particularly for the, the kinds of problems that um, emphasize the importance of data movement, machine learning and simulation. Uh, these are other targets. Uh, we have three TAs. I decided not to, to talk about what everybody is doing. There's so much good work here. Uh, but basically TA1 is about these photonically enabled MCMs. Uh, we have two performers, Intel and Xilinx, uh, and they're both uh, putting uh, advanced photonic IO inside their uh, state-of-the-art FPGAs. And so the idea being there's a lot of different benefits once you do so. Uh, TA2, largely driven by uh, academics, have uh, five performers actually right now, different teams working on going very wide, very parallel, not super high speed per channel, but many, many channels, you know, order of 100 wavelength channels per fiber, highly spatial, uh, and throwing out a lot of the overhead that you normally see in, in optics. So light or no error correction, um, no coding, uh, clock forwarding, uh, very uh, simple transmit and receive circuitry. And then finally, this topic of interconnect packaging and switching. Um, here, following up on, again, John's point about disaggregation, the idea is once you've got all your data in the optical domain, uh, being able to steer your bandwidth where you need it uh, is fantastic, but you don't want to pay the penalty of, of doing O to E to O every time. And so we have uh, large optical switch nodes that we're working on, in particular high radix of 1000 by 1000 uh, IO, uh, where you could put in many channels and put them, take them out on any other fiber um, with essentially very little loss, so 3 dB. Um, this is uh, really promising for new architectures. And just touching on one result, uh, this is also work coming out of uh, Intel's uh, uh, pipes effort. Uh, this is using, leveraging some of the advanced 2.5D packaging techniques, also monolithic integration of CMOS and silicon uh, 
photonics components, which is done by their partner at IR Labs. Those together come into these uh, advanced photonic chiplets um, that are made at global foundries. Uh, these chiplets are sort of order of a couple terabits per second out of a single chiplet. And when you integrate these into a package, um, this one has two, uh, then you can push enormous amounts of optical data right out of your FPGA. And so this is the first demonstration of uh, advanced MCM with silicon photonic IO. And it's, um, even though we're still in phase one, this is coming close to some of our, our phase one program goals. All right, so moving on, I'm gonna try and speed up and talk about a few of our, our um, system, microsystem concepts enabled by heterogeneous integration. And the first one is uh, the MOAB program, Modular Optical Aperture Building Blocks. Uh, so integrative photonics, uh, by which most people these days mean uh, silicon photonics, was invested in heavily um, in the early 2000s by DARPA and went kind of quickly from sort of demonstration of single components to putting sort of dozen or so components on a chip. And then DARPA largely stepped out of the way as a commercial transceiver world took over. Um, however, we've gotten back into it and we've been working a lot on things like new applications. So not just Datacom, but um, doing things like this particular Moab LiDAR chip. This chip actually, uh, which is made by Analog Photonics, startup that came out of MIT um, has on the order of 30 or 40,000 photonic components on it. It is uh, the most sophisticated integrated photonic chip uh, that we know of today. And it is scaling in the next version to uh, much higher. It has uh, many, many thousands of uh, ADCs by flip chipping ASICs, custom ASICs on top to control this. And I'll talk more about this in a sec. Also wanted to say that when you uh, try and do other things, you actually need new materials. And um, the Dodos program is looking at bringing new materials for uh, optical frequency synthesis, which I'll touch on too. Moab, uh, you've heard a lot about this uh, in other domains probably, is about uh, shrinking LIDAR, which today is usually spinning mirrors or, or gimbaled mirrors, uh, usually pulse time of flight to, to map the world. Uh, down to the scale of a chip, right? a postage stamp. And using the concepts of uh, RF beam steering in, by scaling down to optical domains. We're also, instead of sort of simply rastering things around, we're doing random access pointing so that you can look where you wanna, wanna see and coherent detection, FMCW, LIDAR detection. And by doing so, you get sort of orders of magnitude benefit in, in swap and cost and beam steering, frankly, because uh, you're not doing mechanical movement anymore. You're doing electronic steering. Uh, I mentioned a little bit that it, it's similar to a lot of the AESAs that we use today for radars and, and for 5G. Uh, however, the emitting components where you're changing phase between elements have to scale by many orders of magnitude because the wavelength in the optical domain is, is so much smaller. This came out of a program, as many DARPA programs do, out of a seedling investment um, sort of a decade ago that, that stitched together sort of a, a large handful of emitters and showed that you could do beam steering. And um, we're still working on a lot of the, the, the components at sort of seedling level, but, but the MOAB program itself is doing these large picks. The architecture by, by most teams was actually pretty similar where you have a light on chip gets spread out maybe across thousands of phase shifters and thousands of waveguides. Uh, as you change the phase between them, you can steer in one dimension and the emitting aperture is actually a, a surface grating. So changing your laser wavelength allows you to steer in the other dimension. Where we're at now is scaling this in size, um, actually larger than what's shown here and putting a lot of the components, meaning the lasers and amplifiers and electronics all on that same package so that it's truly um, compact and, and uh, 3D HI uh, fabrication. Um, different approaches, I think I'll, I'll skip over some of these, but just to say that uh, while we're talking about silicon and in some cases, three, five materials here, uh, different teams had different approaches for how you would do phase shifters, how you would do um, uh, photonics 
uh, photonic components, but but get the same goal. Uh, we even had one that was doing it in the optical, in the, the visible domain, where you're doing beam steering, not for LIDAR, but for um, uh, visible light displays. Okay, so let's see if uh, this will be visible. Um, so we're making really fast progress. The, the first demonstration, uh, about two years ago, a large sort of optical tabletop, uh, able to steer beam. Um, this was now about a, almost a year ago, shrinking it down. It, the hardware has now gotten uh, smaller yet and able to create um, order of a million spots, independent diffraction limited spots that you can point at and do LIDAR on each spot. Um, and so let's see this, this slide, I don't know how well video actually turns out for everybody at home. Um, working. But you can, yes, it's working, okay. So you can see on the left, sort of, uh, this is at 1.55 microns. So in the sphere, the shortwave IR, where it's eye safe, um, illuminating a room, it looks like it's just sweeping, but it's actually uh, independent spots that are scanning very fast. And then you can do LIDAR returns and reconstruct your uh, 3D image in, in real time. Uh, by scaling aperture size and power, you can scale this out. And so our goal is um, going to a few hundred meters initially. I think we may be able to scale farther than that um, as the aperture scales up. OK, uh, again, you know, we started 2018, sort of first demonstration, a square millimeter. Um, the program really quickly you know, scaled by a factor of 100 and is now scaling by another 100. And as you do so, you're able to do larger and larger uh, LIDAR systems. And for the DOD, insert them into all sorts of different uh, capabilities. If you don't want to use it for LIDAR, just having non-mechanical beam steering is important for doing communications or all sorts of other applications, frankly. All right, so that's Moab. It's one of the things that you could do with integrative photonics. Um, there are many others. Uh, we do a lot of work in, in the uh, P&T world, so accelerometers and gyros and clocks and chem biosensors and so on. Dodos is a fun one um, that I'm going to touch on real fast because it pulls in a lot of the different kinds of materials that we need. Um, the idea is to do optical frequency synthesis and do it on a chip. Uh, today, when we think of lasers, uh, lasers have, have a wavelength, um, but typically when you build a semiconductor laser, you don't really know what the wavelength is very well. You measure it against a, a calibrated source, maybe, you know, atomic transitions, and, and you know your wavelength to within, say, a part in 10 to the 7, something like that. It's sort of based on your, your calibration. Optical frequency synthesis is something different, and it's done in the RF domain all the time. Uh, but it basically says, uh, let's actually do it in a different way. Let's create a, a frequency that we know um, all the way down to zero frequency. And we do this with uh, something called a self-referenced octave spanning comb. So we create these laser combs. We reference one tooth to another. It allows us to know exactly the position of this frequency relative to zero. Um, and then if you have a known reference source in RF, like a GPS signal or an atomic clock or something, you can know your output laser wavelength to something like a hertz or better, one hertz at a couple of hundred terahertz. So this is something like 10 to the, one part in 10 to the 15 or, or maybe eight orders of magnitude better than, than what has been always done up until today. Right? This is actually the, the foundation for a Nobel Prize in 2005, a lot of this um, self-referenced optical frequency comb work, but it was done on a tabletop. Um, some of that has been built into hardware you can buy, sort of several hundred K um, for laboratory use. But Dodos is looking at doing it by integrating all of those components into a, onto a chip and trying to do the whole thing in the order of a, a sugar cube, one cc. Um, so improving cost and size and weight and power by about a thousand X each. Um, we're in phase three. We've made uh, fantastic progress. This is a really challenging program. Uh, able to tune lasers across broad, broad spectrum, able to make them hit absolute frequency to better than one hertz, uh, have incredible frequency stability, and um, 
able to do it on a chip where you just turn on the laser and you create these frequency combs, these soliton, Kerr uh, soliton frequency combs, and integrating the whole thing down to this sort of sugar cube size scale. Um, it's also been the source of uh, sort of endless nature and, and science papers, so fun to see. And if successful, um, there are many, many things you can do when you have this level of frequency control. Uh, very, very high quality uh, RF synthesis, LIDAR, uh, sensing, comms, and, and timing. So, but really in order to make this manufacturable, we came up with the Lumos program. And this is a great example of HI. And this is the last one I'm gonna hit you with. I realize we're getting uh, short on time. I think I've got on the order of four minutes here. Um, and I, I think that the best way to say it is that photonics today, uh, particularly silicon, does not have gain, right? CMOS, every transistor has gain. It's, it's ubiquitous and taken for granted. Even microwave electronics, the gain is the important stuff. Photonics is kind of passive and lossy. And so, so Lumos is about taking the best photonic circuits, which is materials like silicon, lithium nibate, and silicon nitride, and marrying them with, with generally three, five materials. Um, so we can scale complexity, uh, power, and broad spectrum. I'm not going to take a lot of time to say, other than we kicked off this program in the fall. It's a, a really big effort. It's all about uh, heterogeneous integration. Uh, and we're looking to scale so that we have uh, lasers, amplifiers, and gain in foundries. We're working in particular um, with the SUNY uh, AIM Photonics team and Tower Semiconductor with the goal of having a thousand gain blocks per reticle. Uh, we're looking at making high power photonics for microwave, looking at sort of watt class lasers with extremely low noise and looking at broad spectrum gain across the visible 400 to 900 nanometers with really narrow line width. And so this is going to be enabling for um, things like atomic and quantum sensors, microwave systems, and uh, foundry integration. So, you know, just stepping back and saying um, this sort of 20 year journey or so for me has been from, you know, are we there yet? I would say yes. You know, heterogeneous integration is, is the foundation for many of our MTO system uh, programs uh, and touches on sort of everything that we care about, vision and, and sensors, computing and, and information processing. Um, and it, it's really nice to see many programs and uh, more on the way. So with that, let me uh, summarize and say thanks to everybody uh, and look forward to questions. So there's a couple of questions for you um, in the chat, Gordon. What is ARPA's hunch about so-called photonic wire bonding solutions, if any? Yeah. Heard a lot of promotional highlights about them and their applications in silicon photonics, packaging level, optical interconnects, et cetera, hence the question. Yeah, yeah, great. And um, so I would say that various types of uh, photonic integration approaches Photonic wire bonding is one of them. Um, we are under the pipes and Lumos program doing some investment in, uh, I guess you'd, you'd call it additive manufacturing for photonics. Uh, vast majority is using more the sort of parallel process fabrication techniques like we're using in, in semiconductor processing. Um, I think photonic wire bonding is, is really promising and um, it's probably just not happening fast enough so we're doing in Lumos a lot of monolithic integration of different materials so that you can use uh, semiconductor uh, processing techniques. In particular, there's a lot of heteroepitaxy and microtransfer printing. Um, but yeah, I think additive manufacturing like photonic wire bonding is promising as well. Next question from Dave Armstrong. What photonic components do you see being viable or not viable in silicon versus um, three through five technology? Okay. Yeah, Dave. Um, so I, I believe that uh, generally gain, you know, lasers and amplifiers, it's going it, to, it's a very, very difficult problem to, to solve this in, in silicon. Uh, indirect band gap is something that's really hard to overcome. I've followed the, the field for a long time. I think three fives are fantastic. And so the, the challenge of putting three fives on uh, is it maybe an easier one to solve, right? And so 
So we're doing a lot of work, for instance, with heteroepitaxy of quantum dot materials that are pretty uh, tolerant to uh, dislocations and, and other kinds of defects. And um, I think that similarly, you know, silicon has really weak light matter interactions. So moving to three fives is good for modulators and, and frankly detectors. <laughs>